The landmark experiment done by Christian Anfinson utilized an enzyme, a bovine enzyme, called ribonuclease A. And what he did was he took this enzyme and he put it in the presence of urea in order to denature the enzyme. So urea would lead to the denaturation and then also in the same solution he added beta mercaptoethanol or 2 mercaptoethanol. And of course as we talked before this allowed him to reduce the disulf disulfide bonds. So he had then a solution of ribonuclease A, which the en is the enzyme that I've sketched over here um, in, a, in a somewhat non-artistic way, um, showing you that this enzyme in its native tertiary um, structure has in fact four different disulfide bonds. So in the presence of both urea and 2-mercaptoethanol, those disulfide bonds would become reduced and the protein itself weighs on a randomly coiled sort of structure, um, basically with losing all of its potential enzymatic activity. So I'll just draw a very, um, you know, tentative loop-like structure here showing that in the presence of urea and 2-mercaptoethanol, uh, not only do all of the disulfide bonds break, but the enzyme itself is denatured. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and show here um, on the previous picture of the native structure I showed all of the disulfide bonds in different colors, the four of them, and I'm just going to show the residues, the cysteine residues that take part in those bonds um, over here. So you have the blue one that's closest to the first amino acid, so this is showing the amino terminus um, marked as one, and then so the first one was the blue one, um, and if we keep scanning around, there was a green one. So this is the fully denatured, reduced ribonuclease enzyme. And so the, the brilliance of Christian Anfinson was that he then took this fully denatured, fully reduced form of the ribonuclease enzyme and he gradually dialyzed away both the reducing agent and the denaturing agents. So he dialyzed away the urea and the, the beta mercaptoethanol. And the amazing thing that happened was that the protein actually refolded um, and all the air gradually oxidized all of the sulfhydro groups in the reduced ribonuclease and the protein literally regained its native active tertiary structure. This was absolutely phenomenal. So I don't say this lightly when I write, write down that Christian Anfinson demonstrated that the tertiary structure of a protein can be determined by its primary structure. This is phenomenal. This means that the sequence, the primary structure, that the just amino acid sequence is what dictates the folding of a protein. So we can say sequence specifies conformation. This is a fantastic finding and certainly a landmark finding. Now we can talk about nuances to this, um, but for now I want to hit the take home message and let's go ahead and say down here he treated ribonuclease A with urea and reducing reagent to denature it. He then dialyzed away these reagents and the protein regained its native active primer or native active tertiary structure. Now this is fantastic, but I do want to add something because there's sort of a uh, an interesting side note to this experiment because Christian Anfinson also looked at the idea of first allowing the disulfides to reoxidize before dialyzing away the denaturing reagent.
that would be he took away the beta mercapto ethanol first and then the urea this was really interesting because what it led to was scrambled protein um, basically what happened was that when as soon as the um, disulfide bonds were no longer reduced they naturally reformed and they reformed in a scrambled way so what we might see happening and this is just totally random but if the um, the two the beta mercapto ethanol were taken away Let's see if I can kind of show this. So minus beta mercapto. It's horrible writing, but you get the sense. Um, so minus the beta mercapto ethanol, um, keeping the urea present, you get a scrambled protein. Where, say for example, maybe the um, maybe the blue and the red here form a disulfide bond. Um, so kind of mixing and matching where those disulfide bonds would form. So I'll see if I can kind of draw that idea here. So blue disulfide bonds to red, uh, meaning that two cysteine residues that were never intended in the native structure to disulfide bond would do so here because the reducing reagent is removed in the absence or in the presence still of the urea. So the protein remains denatured but the disulfide bonds reform. So then maybe we could say that rather than these two two black cysteine residues of forming disulfide bound, maybe maybe there's another mismatch here between the, the black and the green labeled cysteine. And so and say that we get scrambled protein here. <laughs> Sorry, that's a B. Scrambled protein. Um, so this was a very, very stunning finding. And in fact, it uh, told Christian Anfinson something very important about protein structure. And that is quite simply that disulfide bond formation does not drive folding. Instead, disulfide bonds form after a protein has folded. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down. And hopefully um, all of you guys got this because I'm going to erase this so that I have a little room here to write that down. It should be noted that Christian Anfinson was fortunate to have chosen a protein whose native tertiary structure could be regained uh, with no assistance save that of the removal of urea and tuber mercaptoethanol. There are some proteins out there that do require a help assistance in folding that they have chaperone proteins that help them regain their tertiary structure so it's perhaps an oversimplification to say entirely that um, any protein that you would denature uh, if the denaturation and reducing reagents were dialyzed away would regain its tertiary structure impromptu. Um, but certainly this was a beautiful example that Christian Anfinson chose. And I, I actually want to read you a passage that um, comes from the fourth edition of a biochemistry text by Lubert Stryer. And I love this passage that was written by Christian Anfinson in 1964. It struck me recently that one should really consider the sequence of a protein molecule about to fold into a pr precise geometric form as a line of melody written in canon form and so designed by nature to fold back upon itself, creating harmonic chords of interaction consistent with biological function. One might carry the analogy further by suggesting that the kinds of chords formed in a protein with scrambled disulfide bridges, such as I mentioned early, are dissonant, but that by giving an opportunity for the rearrangement by the addition of mercaptoethanol, they modulate to give up the pleasing harmonics of the native molecule. Whether or not some conclusion can be drawn about the greater thermodynamic stability of Mozart's over Schrodinger's music is something that I will have 
with the, I will leave to the philosophers of the audience. <laughs> He had a pretty sexy mind. Now, before I leave this subject entirely behind, I want to look at one exception to the rule. And there always are, right? There are always exceptions to the rule. For the most part, we know now that primary structure determines tertiary structure. That is, the linear sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain will have everything it needs to encode for the, fully, the full folding of a protein into its native conformation. Now, can anybody think of an exception where primary structure does not determine tertiary structure? Um, by that, I guess I mean, can you think of a place where this, the primary structure stays the same, and yet the tertiary structure changes? This happens in a diseased state. So maybe that helps you to think about it. You guys have probably heard of these. Prions. Proteinaceous infectious agents. Prions cause a group of diseases called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. Some of these include things like bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Um, that's BSE. Uh, AKA mad cow disease. 